thank you. Well, first of all, when you're looking at your screenwriting, you're developing your idea. You've come up with an idea. And in this case, I've got two women go on a crime spree. And so you have to ask yourself some questions. Who are the two women? What crime did they commit? What made them commit the crime? And what happens to them in the end? So you've got some questions. Does anyone want to guess what two women go on a crime spree in this movie? Thumb and Louise. You've got it. <laughs> So here's the structure. This is from the screenwriter's workbook, Sid Field, and it's your basic uh, three-act structure. The first is the setup for your plot point one, and um, typically you want to have your first plot point that moves you, your action forward in the first ten pages of your script. And so um, in this case, they've got their plot point one, Harlan is killed and that moves them into act two where they're on the run and they have confrontation. Um, and then we've got plot point two, their last night together in the resolution. Um, to begin writing, you can either do a treatment or an outline. One of the bad things about doing an outline is that I find I can't read all of my little notes that I've put in the outline afterwards. And so one of the reasons that I suggest a treatment is if you're not going to start writing your script right away and you're going to come back to it maybe months later, you want to be able to understand what you were thinking about your idea. So writing a treatment, you've got your beginning, your plot point one, your plot point two, your ending, and it's typically five pages long. Now, later on, as we get um, into things further, I'll go on like different beats. You have a lot more beats in between these plot point one and plot point two, et cetera. But this is a real basic structure for a treatment. Now, how many pages? Um, Chinatown is the example here. Again, this is from the screenwriter's workbook, Sid Field. And we have act one. Um, pages 1 through 30, and you've got your first plot point where the Mrs. Mulray shows up. Um, then you've got your pages 30 through 60 to the midpoint, the connection between Mrs. Mulray and Noah Cross. And then you've got your plot point 2, they find the glasses in the pond, and that leads you into Act 3. This is 120 pages, Chinatown, um, I assume many of you are familiar with Chinatown, is a drama. So if you're looking at a romantic comedy, you're looking at more like 90 pages, a horror script, something more like 90 pages. Um, there are some scripts that are shorter than that. I don't know if anyone remembered Winter's Bone um, with Jennifer, fill in the last name for me. I'm space. Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence, how can I forget that? Um, Winter's Bone is only 77 pages, so it's a pretty short script. And when you're writing your script, if you're not writing uh, what I would call a director's cut, where you put a lot of detail and narrative into it, if you're writing it to sell it as a spec script, um, you could have a fairly short script that's even shorter than 90 pages. And so that script was 77 pages. So 90 pages isn't the end-all and be-all of a rom-com script or a horror script but it gives you a basic idea. Um, definitely, I would say nothing. I wouldn't go over 120 pages unless you're Quentin Tarantino. Mm -hmm. If you're Quentin Tarantino, you can do whatever you want. And, and if you've read his scripts, and I don't suggest reading his scripts to teach you how to write a spec script because it's so detailed. If you read Django Unchained, he goes into so much detail in his script, and it's truly a director's cut. So you want to look for scripts that are written by people who are not directors if you're looking to read scripts. So your protagonist, your hero, um, who is your protagonist? Do we care about them? And the main thing is, are we going to want to spend between 90 to 120 minutes learning about them? Open his curtains for him so he can see God's beautiful work. And he'll know that even things like this happen for the best. What do they teach you to talk like this in some Panama City sailor want a hump hump bar? Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. 
So when I think about this protagonist, um, is he a very likable guy? <laughs> no, he's totally not a likable guy, but um, do we want to see more of him in the film? Sure. Yeah. yeah, he's interesting. And so your protagonist doesn't necessarily have to be a likable character, but there's certain things that give him empathy, his OCD, his uh, weird way that he walks on the streets and different things. And we learn to care about him as he cares about the dog throughout the film. And so there's different things that, that do give him empathy, but your protagonist doesn't necessarily have to be a likable character. And that's why I like that example as, as good as it gets one best picture, so. But would you say that was uh, because of the story or because of the act, because of Jack Nicholson? I think it's the story and the actor. I mean, I think both of them together created a synergy. Yeah, I think it was cast really well. Yeah. Okay, so what makes your protagonist a compelling character? We already talked a little bit about empathy, that we have empathy for him because he had OCD. And um, Michael Hogg says that there's different things that you must have, um, jeopardy, likability, fear, and power. In the next clip, that I want to show is something where I think that all five of these are working at the same time for this character. If you remember Matt Dillon's character in Crash, um, he's not a very likable character. Once again, he does some things that um, when he pulls over this woman at a stop, he does some things to her that aren't so nice and so... Um, he ends up meeting this character in this particular scene, and we get to see how she reacts to what he has done. But um, I think in this particular one, all of the five elements are working. So you have the empathy of the character, and also the empathy of this Matt Dillon's character shows through with taking care of his father because his father has these like problems going to the bathroom, and it's like this really sad. Um, scene where his father's like trying to go to the bathroom and he can't go to the bathroom and so you have to watch Matt Dillon taking care of his father and so you get some empathy there and then the rest of it the jeopardy um, the likability and the fear and the power really I think come through in this next clip if it will just come up I guess we're, we're waiting for that to come up anyone want to think about their favorite characters from films Anyone have any ideas about their favorite characters? Yes, oh, Kevin. I like Amadeus. Amadeus. Yeah. What do you like about it? It, is, uh, it shows a character of Mozart heart that is really ridiculous and silly. Okay. And even as brilliant as he was, that he had this really ridiculous side of himself. Anyone else have any Idris? Uh, Selena from... Uh, the world, I saw Blood Wars yesterday, and the uh, empathy part, jeopardy, likability, fear of letting go of losing our life or losing our daughter and family, and in the end, power. Okay. All, all of it was there. So she had all five? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yes, Joe? Uh, that old movie from 1957, Cary Grant, I think was the actor's name, played the incredible shrinking man. I was character how he him and his wife were on a boat trip on the ocean and this radioactive mist got him. He's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until he lives in a dollhouse and gets chased by the house cat into the basement. And the people think he's dead, but he's alive. And uh, fights a spider at the end uh, to survive for this piece of cake. His wife left the only food that he had that the spider was right next to. Because Grant Williams. Grant Williams, okay. Until he finds out he anticipates, but still says he's alive in spirit up in heaven. Cool. He doesn't exist. Yes. I am too. It's Ke Cary Grant in North by Northwest. And uh, Kevin Klein in uh, Fish Called Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Very quirky character. I don't know if this is going to come up or not, but I think we've all got different examples that we can think of where you get all of these empathy, jeopardy, likability, fear, and power. In this particular clip, Matt ends up saving a woman that he was like really rude to on a traffic stop and he's 
she's scared of him and he has to get her out of this flaming car before it explodes. And so you get um, the jeopardy of him possibly dying and the likability of him. He goes back in, he saves her even after they pull him out of the car and um, the fear and the power in that particular one. That was Crash. It won uh, Best Picture and Best Screenwriting. So one wish, of the reasons... I wish you saw the previous episode when he groped her. And, yeah, and you know, so he gropes her. With her husband and he couldn't do anything. Yeah, I, I, I think I've seen that preview of, of that. And, you know, they were stopped and yeah. the husband was there. And, yeah, and some hard topic to talk about. And the movie did a good job. Yeah, and the thing is, this particular character, he's not a very likable character because he no. gropes her at that stop, but this particular scene, it takes the jeopardy, the fear, and the power, and all of those things into it, so you actually have some empathy for this character, even though he's done a bad thing earlier in the movie, and so that's what I like about that particular, particular one. Okay, so Mastering the Two-Minute Pitch, Michael Haig, it's a book that I recommend, has, says the protagonist only has four goals, and it's either to win, retrieve, escape, or stop. And so those are your four goals that you want to have as the protagonist. Another thing to think about is the backstory of your character, and there's different ways that you can do a backstory of your character. You can do youth experiences, so the circle of being, um, if your biography, like uh, Larry Karaszewski and his writing partner, is it Stephen Alexander? Scott. Scott Alexander. Scott Alexander, they do a lot of biographies, so you can look at that per professional, personal experience. Um, characterization, look at the details of the life, um, where they work, and all of those details. Um, live research, you could do interviews to research the background of your character. Um, textual research, books, newspapers, and one that I recommend is the Comic Toolbox. And even though it's called the Comic Toolbox, this particular book, I've used it for dramatic characters. And one of the things he, he goes through different things, a comic perspective, flaws, humanity, and exaggeration are some of the things that he uses to build the backstory. So. For a character I had as a child, their comic perspective was that the child was an adult. And so that was kind of the comic perspective. The flaw of that particular child was that this child was arrogant. Um, the humanity for that child was that they were generous and honest. And the exaggeration was that this child was the parent's parent. So the child was act acting as a parent to their own parents. And so that's some of the things that the comic toolbox goes through to help you develop your characters. And I found it useful um, with developing story as well. So that's something I recommend. Dialogue. Um, does it sound like how people talk? Is the dialogue showing something rather than telling something? You don't want to have expositionary dialogue. Like you don't want to have your characters having to tell a whole backstory of the script. I can't remember the actor's name, but he said he did not want to have to do exposition unless there were bombs going off in back of him and all kinds of other things because it's just a really boring way to tell a story. So you want your dialogue to be showing something. Um, and what does the dialogue reveal about your characters? And at the risk of um, having another video clip go bad. My next video clip was for Sex, Lies, and Videotape, but it was Siskel and Ebert's review of it back in 1989. And one of the things they said about that particular movie was it was the way that people talk is what they liked about it. And so really examining and being um, a student of watching people and the way that they talk is probably the best way to develop your dialogue. And does your dialogue have subtext? Um, how many people saw the movie Fargo? 
So quite a few, almost everyone in this room. Um, does, do you guys remember the scene where um, Marge is cross-examining Jerry at the car dealership? And Marge is like investigating this and she has no idea that Jerry's behind it and, and she's asking him these questions and he's getting increasingly upset. And at the end he answers, ma'am, I answered your question. I answered the darn question. I'm cooperating here. And so he, he ends up running off and she ends up saying that she's on a chase for him because he runs off the car dealership. But there it's... Uh, what I think is a really good example of subtext because the audience knows what's going on. The audience knows that Jerry has done some bad things and that he's basically hiding this thing from Marge and Marge is on her line of questioning and she's on a totally different route. So you've got that subtext going on between them. First 10 pages, really the most important, I think, part of your script if you're sending out scripts to have them um, be possibly purchased by someone. I would like to think that the um, powers that be in Hollywood, the gatekeepers as it is, would read a whole script, but I don't think that they, they read the whole script. I think they look at your first 10 pages, and if your first 10 pages doesn't have what they like in it, they just like throw your script in the circular file. So. Um, in your first 10 pages, do we know who the protagonist is? Um, can we feel empathy for this hero, even if they may not seem likable character? Like we talked about, some of these characters aren't that likable. And do we want to read past ten, page 10? Now, this is a fairly complex structure, and this is what I use for my outlines for <laughs> films. And it's from Save the Cat. Um, how many people have read the Save the Cat books? Okay, so a couple people are familiar with Blake Snyder. And he goes into really detailed analysis of movies in his Save the Cat series and talks about opening image, theme stated, setup, catalyst, debate, break into act two, B story, fun and games, midpoint, bad guys close in, dark night of the soul, break into act three, final, and final image, which is the opposite of the beginning image. And so... That's what I use to structure my screenplays is coming up with all of that in an outline structure. And um, Save the Cat, I highly recommend it. So one of the things you want to do is read scripts if you want to become a better writer. Um, these are some links that I have to where you can read various different scripts. Um, Simply Scripts. Um, MoviePage.com, Scriptorama, and Daily Script. Another good source for scripts is Blue Cat. Um, Blue Cat has a screenwriting competition, but they also um, send out newsletters on a monthly basis where they have links to various different screenplays, and so that's a good uh, good source for screenplays as well. Is that bluecat.com? Yeah, bluecat.com. And how do I format my script? Um, self Celtix used to be free. I don't know if it's still free. Um, it might have like a minimal charge to it. Um, Final Draft is what most people use. I use Movie Magic. I just prefer Movie Magic, how it um, sets up. It'll set up things for you in production, which is what I like about Movie Magic. I don't know if Final Draft does that. Final Draft sets up your production as well. Um, and then screenplay.com is another another link. Oh. Can I can I add one to your list real quick? Fade in. Fade in. Fade in. Oh yeah, they're $80. good for pitching. No, it's full. It's just as good as Final Draft, in my opinion. Oh, it's another screenwriting. Yeah, fade in. Oh wow. Com, eighty dollars for the whole thing. Updates. I'm on the third version now, and I haven't paid for another update for it. Oh, cool. So, That's pretty reasonable. Eighty dollars. Yeah, very. Well, my budget was perfect. <laughs> cool. And then rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. That's, I think, one of the most important things. Um, it's one, of the, I think, one of the most difficult things is rewriting the script. <laughs> Try not to set the script on fire in the process. <laughs> and how do you pitch your script? So you've rewritten your script. You think it's ready to be sold. 
Um, don't tell your story. You want to have a relationship with the person, and so the people that you're pitching to, if you're pitching dramas to a company that's looking for comedies, that's obviously not going to work out. So you want to do some background about the people that you're pitching to. I made the mistake of pitching a um, mortgage-related pitch to a company for, um, oh, I can't think of her name, Demi Moore. And she was already involved in this Wall Street type um, movie. I can't remember what the name of it was with Kevin Spacey and Demi Moore. Does anyone remember the name of the movie? Oh, About hedge fund managers and... <coughs> yeah, and so they basically told me that Demi Moore was already attached to something that because um, I'm like, I have the perfect pit for, perfect movie for Demi Moore, and she was already attached to something that was similar to my script. So really do some background on who you're pitching to. Um, reveal why you wrote the script. Um, they want to know your passion for why you're doing the project. Um, have some revelation with your hero, goal, conflict, and passion. And then um, don't be afraid to request whether or not they want a copy, ask them if they want to read your script. And so I've had success in pitching, um, getting scripts read. Uh, the main thing is getting the script sold, and so that's my next goal is to get it sold. How do you protect your script? Um, you can copyright it. Um, you can register it with the Writers Guild. I think it costs $22, or maybe it might be a little bit more now. Or you can create a poor person's copyright, which is mailing it to yourself, basically. And here are some miscellaneous links. Um, <coughs> without a Box, Creative Screenwriting, IMDb, Chicago Dramatists. They have a screenwriting classes every once in a while in Chicago if you want to take screenwriting classes. Um, Ink Tip. <coughs> And Ink Tip is a good place to try and sell your script to. They've got like a, um, a monthly magazine that comes out. And you must reject rejection. It has nothing to do with you. So if your script is being rejected, don't take it personally. It may not be the type of thing that they're looking for um, at that particular time, like um, my example with Demi Moore's attachment. She was already attached to something that was similar. So, and with that, any questions? Yes, Kevin. Do you um, usually, uh, is it usually a good idea? Did you actually mention that this was a person that you had in mind for? Oh, yeah. I went in there knowing that um, they represented Demi Moore and saying that I've got her. Oscar winning script for her that this is like the perfect role for her and at that point they said she was already attached to something similar so. So mentioning like a bankable star is usually a pretty good idea. Well it depends if the company if you're going to pitch to a company that they're a management company and they're already representing certain stars if you think your script is compatible to one of those particular stars I would go ahead and mention it because they're the management company for that particular star. Right? I guess that's it. So thank you all. Thank you. Guys.